SportsRadioDetroit.com. Someone said football, so I come running. What's going on, everybody? No chance in Bingville. Can't see my dance. You want to see the new Tweeter end zone dance? Check it out. You know what it's called? What? New Tweeter end zone dance. Nice. Nice. Lions SRD on SportsRadioDetroit.com. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Lions SRD right here on SportsRadioDetroit.com. I'm Ben Sloggy, joined with. Actually, he's back. He wasn't here last week, but it's okay. He had family matters to attend to. Marty Stouffer's back. Marty, I, I, I know we missed you on the draft. Let's quickly get your thoughts, though, since we missed you on last week's episode. It was a nice joke that you felt betrayed on Twitter. <laughs> Made me cry a little bit inside, and I died a little bit. I was like, that's not the intent, and you know that. But uh, what were your thoughts on the draft, man? Just really quick. You know what? I, I, I appreciated the draft. Ben, we, we talked beforehand. Uh, you know Jared Davis, Gerard Davis, however, yep. you, however you want to his name. You know he was one of the guys that I really, really wanted. And they got him. And this is how excited I am. I, he... The Jared Davis jersey is the first one I've ordered since Indomitian Sioux. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I think he's going to be that guy that's going to help solidify that defense. There's nothing the kid can't do. I mean, is he undersized? Sure. So is Zach Thomas, and he's one of the most prolific linebackers to play the game. So I'm all about that pick. I would have I would have preferred Watt, but I'm perfectly happy with Jared Davis. Um, I like the Tease Tabor pick. Interesting. Uh, Why? Why? Why do you like that one? Because here's the thing. I saw a, a lot of, well, he's not fast. He's not fast. Well, no, you're right. He's not. But he's smart. He knows how to play the game. And, he, and he, he's, he's not going to make a stupid play. He's going to make the right play. So I don't care if he's all that fast because he's going to shut you down. He's mm-hmm. going to make the right play. Uh, sure, he's going to get burned at times. Sure. But so did Darrell Rivas at times. I mean, it, everybody does. It happens. Oh, sure. But I, I, I liked it. But, I, I mean, it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't where I would have went. I was hoping maybe – maybe for a Sidney Jones late round two, early round three. But because I kind of felt like we're good at starting corners for now. But, you know, hey, I'm, I'm okay with a Tabor pick. Galladay, I, I, can't, I can't say anything about Galladay. I don't know him. Northern Illinois doesn't get a lot of traction here in western Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you guys are dominated by Pitt and uh, Penn State. And, rightf- and I mean, rightfully so. Those are fun programs to watch. Don't get me wrong. And West Virginia. We get a lot of West Virginia, too. Interesting. Uh, that makes sense, though. That does. That yeah. makes sense. I, I like the Reeves-Maven pick. Uh, he's probably going to be a special teams contributor, I would imagine. But I, I liked him because he's, he's athletic as hell. I loved the Michael Roberts pick. I, I think he's, he's a solid blocker. He can catch, and he's just gargantuan. Like, he is massive. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he's athletic. So I, I think he's going to be a nice addition because, I, I mean, I don't dislike Ebron. I just don't trust him because he's just got too many times where he's got stone hands, and it, it drives me nuts. Um, the well, Jamal we, Agnew pick. Well, I was going to say really quick, sorry not to cut you off, but, I, I mean, oh, you and I said on this podcast, though, that we knew for weeks, we, not weeks, months, let's be honest, that Ebron was going to you know, get the option. Oh, yeah. I mean, because there was literally – no tight end depth on this team outside of Ebron. You had Cole Wick, who you drafted last year, or didn't even draft. He was an un, uh, unrestricted uh, free agent after the draft. So he's outside of that, he was your only tight end. And, you know, that right there, everyone's like, well, Ebron drops the ball too much. Well, yes, he does. That's fair. But he also, and, and, we, and we stated this on Lions SRD, and this is why I kind of want to make a point about it. In the last three years that he's been here, he's improved. He's yeah. gotten better. I mean, you get, the drops have kind of stayed the same, but the yards go up, the targets go up, everything goes up. Touchdowns go with the guy. He was the only red zone threat when your biggest wide receiver is six foot two. I mean, that's why. Yep. I mean, that's why Galway, as you mentioned just really quickly earlier. That's why he's a, I mean, he's a six foot four guy who runs four or five speed. The reason why you get him, he's quick, 
He's not fast, but he's quick, and he catches the ball. He's a possession receiver who's tall. You can have this guy in the slot. You can have a guy like Michael Roberts. Same thing. A guy who's six foot four, six foot five. You know, p- built like a power forward because that's basically what he was in basketball. Well, you know what they do, Marty? They they run box out drills for at least thirty minutes every single day in practice. You know what he can do in an, in an end zone? Box out a linebacker and with the big like catcher's mitt paws of hands that he has can be a target now will he drop the ball we don't know but I mean not to cut you off on on your tangents or anything like that but I mean we knew Eric Ebron was going to be a lion after this season it was just a matter of how long he was going to be a lion is it just going to be the option which I think is good because as we've said before Bob Quinn likes to have a meritocracy he wants you to earn your spots even when he signed Darius Slay he gave him escalators in the contract to make that max money to make him one of the top paid corners in the league if he hit those escalation points. So like he wants he wants you to look at your contract as an escalator, not just as a hey, I'm a made man, I've made my money. No, he wants you to still work for your money and get those bonuses. So it's not right. all bad. And I think that's the way to go to be honest cuz too many times you see guys get these big contracts and they just they, they they just don't work for it. So I I you know Albert Haynesworth, we're looking at you, uh, <laughs> and Dominican so Sue, we're looking at you, which we'll get yeah, into later yeah. on in this podcast. Yeah, um, but just to finish up the draft talk, uh, I'm I'm unfamiliar with Jamal Agnew, um, uh, the defensive tackle from Arkansas, led better. I like that pick because our defensive line was not very good last year, and I really feel like Ledbetter is one of those guys he can step in and he can rotate with. Nada with Robinson mm-hmm. and and uh, he he can, he can play he can pretty much play he can be a plug and play right pretty much right away kind of like a Kerry Hyder too a little bit built the same way yeah. can can work defensive end and defensive tackle so yeah there's there's value there for certain right and and the pick that kind of had me scratching my head and Ben I know you're gonna want to talk about this one was Brad Kaya the quarterback from from Miami oh yes I we, don't we have a like whole topic pick. on this right I, I don't dislike the pick. But I also wasn't thrilled about it either. But we'll get into that later. And the Definitely. pick that I thought was really fun was the uh, the Eastern Michigan kid, Pat O'Connor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I know just just from from I believe it was your timeline or somebody else on Twitter. I know that he was was kind of an animal last year. I mean, if, if memory serves me correctly, he he set some kind of record. Was a school record or division record or something? I think it was. A, I think it was a school record for sacks. So I mean, if he if that's all he's going to do is come down in obvious passing rush pass rush situations with his hand in the dirt, that I I think that could be a lot of fun. Oh, uh, I oh liked yeah. it. I, I liked it. I I don't think it was a home run, but it was it was a good draft. It was solid, and uh, I really enjoyed it, man. I, I I thought it was I thought it was it addressed needs. Okay, so I'm I'm glad you ended it that way because I have I obviously as a journalist have follow up questions for the fan. So. After you, do you, how do you compare this draft to last year's draft? Is it very similar in your mind that they just say, you know what, we're going to go best available for what, and then need like, are, like, did you see that? Cause when I looked at the draft, they still went best available in need in the same round. Last year you had Taylor Decker. Everyone's like, Oh my God, the lions are reaching for Taylor Decker. No, they're not. He's actually a really good left tackle. It's a need. He plugs and he fills a hole, and then you look down the line with with the draft, still plug and playing, putting in holes, getting guys that are athletic, best available. Because a lot of people were like, "Who's Miles Killebrew in the fourth round?" And actually, it turned out he's actually not that bad. So, do you see that this year's draft and last year's draft were kind of the same in that regard? Yeah, but this this class has big shoes to fill because last year's class, what nine out of ten, eight out, eight out, out of ten. Nine, they got on the field. Yeah. yeah, And they contributed right away. I mean, Zettel, a sixth or seventh round pick, he went out and contributed right away. Yep. Uh, Glasgow, everybody contributed right away except for Rudock and the long snapper. Exactly. So, and Rudock was signed late in the year, uh, which, again, we'll get into because he goes in with the Kaya talk. But right. he, I mean, he was signed to protect from going to the Bears. Yep. So, you know, so technically you're right. Nine out of ten of the draft picks – did make the roster and because yeah. because of, of that protection signing and getting him on the 53. 
So yeah, I, I think this class, I think this class, it addressed needs and it was best available. I don't really feel outside of, and I'm only saying this just out of sheer ignorance, outside of the Agnew pick, I don't really feel they reach for anybody. Um, I mean, I saw a lot of people on Twitter were kind of like, wow, really Jamal Agnew now? But I mean, they weren't, uh, they only took him like a round early from what I was, from what I was gathering from, from the Twitter sphere here. But I mean, overall, I, I liked it. I, I liked what they did. Okay. So next question, just cause in the first round, this was, this was the talk, right? Reuben Foster sliding. There was the rumor, obviously that his shoulder injury is actually worse than people anticipated because the initial procedure he went under didn't necessarily take. So he may have to get another procedure after rookie camp. Uh, when the 49ers, uh, you know, go through that. When you, because as you said, and it's completely fair because Gerard Davis is a guy who's athletic. He can help you in run support. He did play hurt last year on a bad angle, ankle, but he still was productive being probably 85, 90% at best at Florida. And Florida has a good defense. But would you have been happy if Reuben Foster was the Lions pick or are you truly content that it's Gerard Davis? Like when you saw the slide happening, when the, when the lion, when that chime happened, were you thinking, Hey, if it's Reuben, like Reuben Foster, Reuben Foster, or were you the guy sitting on his couch being like, hope to God they, they, they go smart and it's Davis. What, what camp were you in? I I was I was in the smart camp. I wanted them to go Davis or even Watt. Like I said, and I and I'll beat that horse till you know till the cows come home. Uh, those were those were two of the guys that I really really wanted. And oddly enough, I get to see T.J. Watt every Sunday because he got drafted by the Steelers here in my hometown. So that's going to be fun to watch. Uh, but I wanted them to draft Davis. Uh, when Reuben Foster started sliding, I immediately went, man, something's wrong because he was projected to go top ten, and mm-hmm. you know, he just kept sliding and sliding and sliding. And uh, I was I was overjoyed with the Davis pick. I'm glad we didn't go for Reuben Foster. I heard you and Mike say last week that uh, you know the comparisons are always going to be there. Like what happens if Foster ends up being the better of the two? Oh sure. I I don't think he's going to be. I think he was kind of overhyped because he was coming from Bama and everybody on that defense is a stud. But here's the thing: I was watching college football last year too. And I didn't hear his name all the time. I didn't hear his name being called. Well, look at the play Reuben Foster just made. I did hear that with Davis. I did hear that with Watt. I did hear that with Tease Tabor. I heard a lot of those same names. I, I wasn't hearing Reuben Foster a lot right. until he came out for the draft. All right, last. So I, go no, ahead. I'm, no, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to cut you off because I was going to give you the last uh, follow up question, but go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm glad they didn't go with Foster. I'm glad they didn't go and get that shiny new Porsche, and they just instead they went for the they went for the smart pick. I mean, I, I'm I'm totally satisfied with the Davis pick. Oh yeah, I mean you you can't fault him for it, and you're right, he's sliding for a reason. And even though, like any rational thinking person would be like, why is he sliding? What is it? And there was, I mean, there was the red flag at the combine when they had him go through his medical procedure, and he caused the ruckus there, and then left. So you knew that he didn't get fully evaluated. That's a red flag there. You also knew that he did injure his shoulder at Bama, uh, you know, in his playing career. And the way he hits, it makes complete sense that he would because he's a guy who doesn't just lay the wood. He brings a sledgehammer when he hits you. He's just, I'm there to, he's kind of like, he hits, I want to say he hits like James Harrison. James Harrison never lays the wood on someone. He brings a sledgehammer to make sure that you remember and then possibly forget that James Harrison hit you. It's, it's, yep. it's the same style. And when you do that, you're going you're gonna to jam your shoulder. But fi- uh, last final up, uh, follow-up question for you, Marty. Are you happy or not that the Lions did not address a, what people, and you, know, you could say we were both in this camp, that they needed to address the running game, that they didn't draft a uh, running back were you happy were you confused what were your thoughts on that uh i'll go one further and i'll say dismayed okay especially when and i'm drawing a blank the kid from florida state especially when he started sliding delvin Delvin. cook yep i know cook's a head case i get it in my opinion he was arguably the best running back in the draft when he started sliding i was kind of like wow that that'd be a nice get but you know 
Jim, uh, not Jim Caldwell, I'm sorry. Bob Quinn has also said, you know, the running game's not just the running backs, it's also the linemen. So yeah. I, I think there was a lot of work to be done there. I was, I was kind of dismayed, though, because, you know, and I know we'll get to the, line, the, the running back situation. I'm not big on this running back group they have, they have right now, and I, I really felt like they should have addressed it. Um, but who knows? I mean, it's, the, the league is now a, it, it's a, it's a dual back, sometimes mm-hmm. triple backs uh, uh, league. So maybe that'll work for us. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I also think Bob Quinn is enticed by what he has in Amir Abdullah because he hasn't seen it. Right. I mean, he's he's. I mean, he's seen tape. We've all seen tape. I mean, when you look at Amir Abdullah's tape in at when he's at Nebraska, the guy's electric. He just fumbles a lot, even when he I was mean, in college. His, career touch, his first career touch was what a sixty-some yard touchdown run. So I mean, we've seen it. I was gonna say it was a it was I yeah it was a long touchdown run. I don't think it was sixty yards. I think it was more. Uh, like I think it was 25 to 30, but yeah, no, his first touch, he was gone. So, and the funny thing is if you watch, and this is why I love these type of shows and I'm glad that all or nothing this year is focusing on the Rams because you can watch hard knocks, which is all, you know, training camp and then pick up right at all or nothing, uh, that Amazon's going to do with the Rams and see how the season played out. But the reason why I bring it up, All or Nothing was on the Cardinals last year when it debuted, and in that draft room, they were f- foaming at the mouth to get Abdullah, and they were pissed that the Lions drafted him. They're like, oh, well, I guess we'll take this kid out of Northern Iowa, David, what's his name? Dave, David, jo- yeah, I guess David Johnson, um, we'll take him, we need a running back. Turned out to work okay for him. But, I mean, you could tell Bob Quinn wants to see what he has. And you're right. You can argue that the running game is going to get better with how they've made improvements in free agency. And, I th- and here's the thing, though, too. If you don't like Amir Abdullah, there's going to be teams that are going to want to get Amir Abdullah. So maybe you can trade Amir Abdullah for like a third-round, fourth-round pick if you're truly not happy with him. Also, he needs to stay healthy. So, I mean, it makes sense a little bit that – he doesn't, you know, that he didn't really look at running backs. And I'm surprised the Packers passed on Dalvin Cook. I mean, yeah. the Packers had him right there, first pick of the second round. They're like, you know what? No thanks. And the Packers need a running back. All they have is Montgomery, who's a converted wide receiver, to be their running back. I mean, they got rid of Lacey. And you look at the Packers, and this is what's going to uh, transition into a, a, a quick side point because Nate Burleson, who's making his headway and now is going to be on uh, the CBS Sunday show before games kick off on CBS, he thinks the Lions are right there now with the Packers and can contend for the NFC North. I'm not here to tell you that's true or not. I'm just reporting what the guy – I'm the messenger in case you haven't read it yet that Nate Burleson, <clears throat> Nate Burleson truly believes – the Lions can finally contend for the NFC North, which the funny thing is, that's how Bob Quinn admitted at the end of last year. He goes, look, quickest way to get to the playoffs is win your division. That's the quickest way to do it. And if you look at it, if you look how New England built their team with Belichick and Kraft and, and how they were drafting, look all the way back to about right around... I want to say right around 1996 when they went to their first Super Bowl where they lost to Brett Favre. If you look at the team that they were building since then, they, and then they bring in Belichick, you could tell that they were building their team to win their division. There, it's no coincidence that the Patriots have won their division every single year, basically for the last, what, six years, eight years? Something like that, yeah close to a decade. I mean, I'm not looking at the numbers right in front of me, but it, it feels like they've won it for the last 15. But we know that, I mean, that, that's not necessarily the case. Maybe it is. But with that, with that mindset, Nate, Nate Burleson even said, hey, the Lions, they're right up there with the Packers. Not going to say, you know, we have a lot of stuff to sift through, including preseason games and the beginning part of the schedule because the first eight games is not easy at all. Uh, but I just thought it was interesting that Nate Burleson uh, basically giving uh, the Lions some, as Sean Belegent would say, some cornbread, buying into the Lions a little bit and saying, you know what, maybe the NFC North's not just a given anymore. Maybe people will fight for it. 
A uh, couple of quick uh, housekeeping things. Uh, Lions did waive two players before their rookie camp, which starts on Friday. So the Lions cut tight end Kennard Backman and wide receiver Andrew Turlsey. So if you're if you're sitting in your car like, who are they? Well, don't worry. We're thinking the same things because they're not important. They clearly can cut guys, and if they really want them, they can bring them back. But one interesting name uh, that popped up that's going to be joining this camp, Matt Asiata, a guy that was in uh, Minnesota, had you know some good carries last year with Adrian Peterson going down. Granted, the Vikings got... Uh, Dalvin Cook, and they also got uh, Latavius Murray after getting rid uh, and parting ways with Adrian Peterson. But it's just interesting that Matt Asiata is kind of brought in to this running back room. Marty, you even said you're not that happy with the running back room as it is, and that's completely fair because I don't think a lot of people are. But when you see a name like that, and you see like the guys that he's brought in, he brought in Arian Foster. Brought in uh, Ridley at, at you know at points you know trying to like kick the tires on guys seeing if it's a fit. Also, I mean, one of the uh, kids that they got out of Cincinnati is a running back uh, who's kind of a big thumper. Um, you know they're they're looking to find creative ways to basically help the running back room and, and get better. Not only helping it through the offensive line and what they did in the off season. But what did you think of that when you saw Matt Asiata was in a Lions camp? To me, I did the typical dog head turn and went, huh, what? Like, I double-checked and I made sure that I read that information right, and it's true. Matt Asiata is in Allen Park. I hate this move, and I hate it for several reasons. I hate it as a fan because I, I can't stand his running style. He's not special. He's not, he's not even overly good. Like, you said he had some nice carries. Yeah, he did. I'm not going to take that away from him. I just, I don't think he's, he's going to be this year's St- uh, Stevan Ridley. He's not going to even make it out oh, of Oh, sure. Pro- I mean, probably not. It's just, it's interesting that they brought him in. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird. I mean, maybe they're going to pick his brain about Minnesota. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what, you know, another scrub has to offer. I, I just, I, I don't get it. It's it's not a move that, that I'm particularly thrilled about, but I'm not going to be too upset about it either because. Like I said, I, I don't see him making it out of camp. But when I saw it, I was kind of like, ugh, really? Like, Matt Asiata. And then, and I also hate him from a fantasy football purpose, too, because, you know, as, as you know, we all, we, we all play it. And I, I kind of relied on him, I want to say, a season or two ago, and it kept burning me. So I, it's just, ugh, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it at all. I mean, yeah, it, no, it, you're probably right. He's not going to be a guy that's probably making the roster. He's going to be a guy that's going to compete. And especially in the preseason, he's going to compete, see what you have, and maybe even get guys like Dwayne Washington some experience. Because the only longest tenured guy in that room is Theo Riddick. You look, I mean, the, honestly, you look at that room, it's very inexperienced because you have Riddick, and then after that, you have Abdullah, who can't really speak to you know, being an NFL veteran per se. Because he, we've only seen flashes of him. He always gets injured, or he fumbles and leaves the game. You don't know. Zach Zenner. I mean, he's a guy. He's a practice squad guy who gets looks because he gets depth. Because they need depth. So I guess you can kind of look at him as as a veteran guy. But if you're looking at Zach Zenner as a veteran guy, ugh, that's yep. that is ugly. I mean, that's looking at a plate full of Brussels sprouts for dinner and being like, really? That's it? Get this out of here. Like, it's just, you know, it's just one of the things that you look at. You're like, dang. And then, of course, yeah, you do have, you know, guys. So maybe it's just helping bringing in, you know, veteran guys, kind of helping them out. You're right. Maybe pick their brain, see what they can get out of them. And, hey, if he makes it not, you know, great. If not, then see ya. Um, But that's going to bring me to the most interesting news of the week, at least in my opinion. Speaking of running backs, because this this name's still out there. Right after the draft, people were like, well, I guess we know what the Lions are going to do. Well, LeGarrette Blunt and the Patriots made a really interesting move. The Patriots are kind of waiting out Blunt, and this is, this is the most Patriots thing of all time. Uh, a couple of days ago on May 9th, 
the Patriots secured two key rights with what they did. They, they tendered an offer to LeGarrette Blunt. They had to do it because the deadline for getting a compensatory pick, if he gets signed somewhere, was coming up. So that's, that's one of two. So basically the offer's out there. So I believe it's a $1.1 million offer for a year. Yes, it is. And if he signs anywhere, anywhere before July 22nd, Patriots get a compensatory pick, which to the Patriots is like cotton candy. They love it. It's addicting. It's sugar. It's fantastic. The best part is if no one signs him after July 22nd, what do the Patriots get? They get LeGarrette Blunt, a guy who's familiar. Now, you can look at the Patriots situation. What they had with uh, James White and Blunt worked in the Super Bowl. I mean, it worked pretty darn effectively. But here's the best part. If, if you're a Lions fan or anyone who pays attention, if the Lions can still sign him, the Lions don't lose anything by signing him. They just lose the $1.1 because they have to match the offer. They don't lose a draft pick. They don't lose anything like that. So it's just it's interesting that the Patriots still set the market on LeGarrette Blunt, and because, I mean, there's teams that are interested in Blunt. The Lions have been linked with them for obvious reasons. Um, you know, not only because they need a running back, but he's a good bruising running back who runs patient and can, you know, be effective. What do you think of that move, Marty? That move, I mean, because it caught, I can tell you this, locally it caught beat writers off guard. They were, they were flat-footed like, wait, what? What do you think about it? I want Blunt in Detroit in the worst way. I have been a LeGarrette Blunt fan even though this is not the reason i'm a fan of his but i've been a fan of his ever since he popped that boise state kid in the jaw oh uh. yeah that was that was that was a crap move but i love his style i love the fact that people only view him as a bruising back when that dude can catch the ball out of the backfield and make people miss too he's a complete back yeah he's getting a little long in the tooth now i get it i would not be upset with him in detroit getting 10 to 15 carries a game especially in short yardage situation because that's the one thing that we absolutely need in Detroit is a short yard thumper. You don't have it in Amir Abdullah. Mm -hmm. You don't have it in Zach Zenner. No. Theo Riddick cannot run the ball. He is terrible at running. He's phenomenal at catching out of the backfield, but he can't run it. And Dwayne Washington is the most uncreative running back I've seen in years. He needs so much help to make anything happen that I just I don't like Dwayne Washington. Well, I would love to have... LeGarrette Blount there. Plus, not only that, you get that veteran presence who's been there. Oh, okay, we're in the playoffs now. Here's how you act. This is what we do. Calm down. It's just another game. We need that kind of presence. Is he a bonehead? Yeah, absolutely he is. But he's also got, what, one, two Super Bowl rings? I, I'd be okay with him. Sign I would love it for him to sign there. I would absolutely love for Detroit to, to get him. Well, to, to be fair, so does Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, Garoppolo, by default, is a two-time or, I think, three-time now Super Bowl champion. But, right, but he didn't contribute. <laughs> one did. Well, no, and, 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 that's, and that's the fair counter. But I, don't, I also don't look at it as, like, you know, LeGarrette Blunt being a, a, a nice veteran. Pre I mean, he has, he has experience, don't get me wrong. And he's been enveloped in the Patriot way, which does tame you a little bit. If, it, if you don't believe so, ask Corey Dillon, for Christ's sake. Hell, yep. even ask Randy Moss if you really want to go that route. Yep. Um, so I, I, I guess I could see maybe a veteran presence there, but just when you're like, he could help out the right. I was just like, huh. I, was, I, I, I don't see that. At least, I mean, with LeGarrette Blunt, I would get him just basically because he can still run. He's a bigger body. And he can help a guy like Dwayne Washington because they're built the exact same way. I mean, Washington needs help with his vision, but he is yeah. quick. He's faster than Blunt. And there's a reason why he contributed in the regular season. It wasn't just because of the lack of depth. He actually can move a little bit, too. So, no, it's just, it was interesting that, you know, hearing you say he can be a veteran presence. Because, again, it makes you look back at the Lions running back room, and you're like, who is the veteran presence? If it, and if you... Back Right, and if you truly do look and say it's Zach Zenner, my God, that I mean, it shows how bad it is. But uh, 
But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't hate LeGarrette Blunt being here. I, th- I think in Detroit it would be fun. It would be fine for a year, see what he has. And, you know, if he's fine, sign him to a, you know, maybe to another year or so. That would be okay, at least with me. Um, because if I see Amir Abdullah have the same fumbling issues or get injured, I'm done with him. And I want the Lions to draft a running back. You know, whoever comes out, you know, it's way too early to, to say who's going to come out. But, I mean, you can look at the running back class and see if someone does fit and take, it, and take another guy. I mean, especially with um, Theo Riddick, who had broken his wrist twice at the end of the year. Yep. You know, so it's just, you know, something like that. But uh, really quickly before we get into that main topic, which is going to be, the, honestly, the meat of the show, the philosophical Brad Kaya topic. Another interesting topic that popped up this week, Ziggy Ansaw and his age. Because when he started his foundation in Ghana, where he's from, they list him at 29 years old, not 27 years old, like he is currently now. And people are like, what does age have anything to do with it, Ben? You know, you're bringing up this story that doesn't make sense. It makes sense a little bit because it's something that a contract extension is going on. And you don't want to necessarily give a guy who's 30 years old a lot of money because 30 years old is near the peak of that mountain in an NFL age and you start declining after 30 years old. So that two-year gap is, is, is a major difference. And you look at it and you're like, huh, the Lions stand by because this was a question in the draft uh, you know, when he was at BYU. Because BYU had to verify his age. BYU said, no, he's, he's the right age. And the Lions, are, the Lions say the same thing. Nope, we believe that he was born May 29th, 1989. He is 27, going to be 28 years old. Marty, when you hear something like this, does it give you pause for, contra- for a contract uh, talk, especially in a guy who in his first three years had 30 sacks? No. It doesn't give me pause. Cause Interesting. If, okay, why? If the school has verified that he's actually 27, and BYU has nothing to gain with this, nothing that I can see. If the school has verified that he's, that he's in, indeed 27, going to be 28, that's good enough for me. Now, I'm not saying that – I don't want to sit there and say, well, the people in Ghana are absolutely wrong. I don't know. I, I, I don't see why they would lie about him being 29. I just – I have to believe where – I, I have to believe the accredited program. I have to believe that BYU is right, that he's actually 27. And if the Lions are content with that, now I know everybody's going to roll their eyes. Oh, the Lions are content. Well, they're a stupid organization. Fine. I get it. Whatever. Same old Lions. You know, that's that running joke. I, mm-hmm. I get it. But if, if, if BYU comes out and says, no, he, he's 27, then I'm going to believe BYU over anybody in Ghana, Africa. Sorry, that's just that's just the way it goes. And like you said, thirty sacks in three seasons—that's that's pretty damn dominant, Ben. Uh, granted, he's had trouble staying on the field lately, but you know, I, he, it doesn't really give me pause. I mean, he, he's he's someone we need. We definitely need to get him locked up for sure. So, but, but the, is the reason why he's not staying on the field and that he's breaking down like he did last year because he is thirty? That's a valid question. Oh, it absolutely I was going to say, with, with news like this, it is a valid, valid question. Because, I mean, it, you look at it, you're like, ah, you know, this is weird. But then, like, you started, like, connecting the dots a little bit, and then you, and this is where, like, you can really bang your head and make a home if you really want to. But, that, like, and then you, you, you make up, like, you know, some of these theories, you're like, ah, maybe, you know, maybe it's plausible. But, I mean, at this point, you're right. BYU has nothing to lose by saying, no, we verified his age when he was in school. The only, I mean, the only thing now that they would lose is maybe face a little bit, but people would right. be like, who cares? It's BYU. Get the football season started. And then, yeah, I mean, people also, and this is something I, I love because people are prejudiced. It, they, they, they are. For one reason or another, in one topic or another, they are. You, and it's hard to break prejudices. And don't get me wrong. This Lions franchise is not giving you any reason to believe that they're breaking any prejudices with Bob Quinn and Martha Firestone Ford. But you have to kind of look at what they're doing and be like, eh, maybe there's also a chance that they're breaking prejudice. Maybe they 
are smart and they verified that he truly is 27 and maybe the birth record that is in Ghana isn't necessarily accurate. What if he's somewhere in between? What if right now he's 28 and he's going to be 29? You know, instead of him being 29, going to be 30. Does it really, like at that point, and you have to look at it, maybe that's how the Lions front office and Bob Quinn's looking at it. They could be like, hell, he could be, you know, 27 going to be 28, or he could be 29, you know, going to 30, or maybe he's 28 going to be 29, and we can work with that. You know, and if that's truly the case, you know, then yes, you're playing a little bit of Russian roulette and seeing if that chamber has a bullet that you have to eat or not. But it's just, you know, you look at it and it and it is interesting because if you can't work out a deal, you can always give him a franchise tag, which would probably be around 16 to 19 million dollars because I think it was 17 uh, this past year for defensive ends. But here's the other scary thing. He's getting contract advice from Indomitian and Sue. Now, we talked about the play to Brussels sprouts with Zach Zenner. You hear that news and you basically want to just throw things and break things. Because Sue, whether you like the guy or not, Marty, I know you do. I love him. And, and people can blame uh, Luan and uh, Mayhew for botching that deal. But eh, you hear something when Ziggy Ansaw says, I haven't talked to him about it, but I will because he's my boy. You know, I wish he would have stayed. Can't control it. I'm sure he's happy where he's at. But, you know, I want to get I want to get in Dominican Sue's advice. Me as someone who's just an observer, I look at that and I, I do I do a hard face palm. I'm like, why, dude? Like, why? Like, of all people, the most polarizing figure outside of Matt Stafford in recent Lions history, you're like, yeah, I, I want to I wanna talk to that guy. I want to see what he has to say. You, you just think to yourself, you're like, why tempt fate there? Like, why even look and see and, you know, text, dial the phone, talk with Indomitian and be like, what the heck's going on here? I mean, Sue did leave. He left for a six-year, $114 million deal with the Dolphins, and he went for the money because he's not producing in Miami at all. Nope. But do, does that give you pause? Or, or are you just going to be lathered up so much, Marty? And, and it's completely fine. You can be. But when you hear that news, does it, do you at least throw up like in your mouth a little bit? Because cause yes. Sue and Money here in Detroit, it's like the Max Scherzer thing with the Tigers. Scherzer was not going to be a Tiger. He wanted way too much money. It wasn't happening. And, right. you know, you have, you know, Dominic and Sue, kind of the same thing, except, you know, Scherzer's actually been good with the Nationals. But, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on it? Well, it, it's kind of twofold. It, it does. It makes me cringe to hear him say that he's going to talk to Sue about this. And not because of any personal malice or anything that I have toward Indomitian Sioux. Indomitian Sioux is one of my favorite Lions draft picks ever. I, th- I feel that he, when he was here, he brought what this team needed. He brought malice to that defensive line. He brought snarl to that defensive line. And yeah, sure, he was dirty as hell at times. I loved it because you know what? It's trench warfare. The bad thing is he just happened to get caught every time. <laughs> but that is I love true. Sioux. The reason I don't like this is Sue, point blank, within minutes of becoming a free agent, said, my agent will decide where I go, meaning he's, he's just going for the money. And I don't like that because I think if he would have stayed here, there could have been something special there because they could have built that defensive line even more around him than they did with worthless Nick Fairley. You know, you add a guy like Ziggy Ansah to Indomitian Sue a Devin Taylor, two Endomic Sue, and a Sean Robinson. And, you know, you're, you're not having these issues with Haloti Nada that we're having with, you know, him being older, mm-hmm. him not possibly not wanting to play because of migraines or concussions or whatever it was. You don't have that, that issue, however minute that may be. You've got, in, in my opinion, you would have the best defensive line with Ansa, Sue, Robinson, and whoever they line up at the other defensive end, because it's going to, who do you block? Um, he chased, he, that, that's, that's, that was my biggest knock on Sue. He left something special or something that could have been special 
for dollars, and that's fine. That's that's what uh, that, that that's what these guys do. That's what they want to do. That's why they play sports because they want to make the money. That's fine, but you moved laterally for more money instead of going somewhere good for less money. Like he could have went, and I don't know if this was ever a discussion. He could have went to we'll use an example, New England for less money and been on a Super Bowl winning team. Instead, and that would have been a step forward. Instead, he just took a side. He just took a step to the side and went. You know what? I'm not really digging the cold. I'm going to take my, my, my talents to South Beach, like LeBron, and I'm going to go down there and make a ton of money, and I'm going to do nothing, unlike LeBron, who we know what he did. But I don't, I, I don't like this. I think Ziggy – I mean, I, I, you want to get advice from him, fine, but don't follow his example because if you're going to follow his example, you're going to end up in the freaking Rams doing nothing. So yeah. just – you know, you got to use your head. I mean, I, I'm all about, hey – who knows what's said behind closed doors? Sue might say, hey, dude, I made a huge mistake coming here. This isn't what it's cracked up to be. Yeah, I'm making money, but we suck. We don't know what's going on behind closed doors. That's I kind of think, I kind of think in Dominican Sue, if he felt that it sucked, he would just say it because <laughs> and Dominican Sue don't care. But no, I, I just, who knows, what, who, who knows what's going to be said behind closed doors? And that's a fair point, Marty. That is an, that is an absolutely fair point. He could. He could say hey man you know detroit's actually building maybe a good team and you can be a cornerstone of that defense and get to the playoffs i mean i'm here in miami we don't know if we make the playoffs all the time you know maybe and and you're right or maybe he'll say you know chase a little bit of money but go to a playoff contender go to a team that's there every year i mean the lions you can say we're on the precipice and on the cusp of doing that but until it happens, you don't know. I mean, the Lions had so many come from behind wins. It wasn't even funny last year. But to be fair, too, in the Lions' corner, they were eight and four last year and second in the NFC for more than just a week. I mean, yep. granted, granted, it was a short stay. I think it was like two weeks, maybe no more than three. But they still were, you know, heading into the last quarter of the season, a team to. Everyone was kind of like, "Hey, look at this! Uh, look at this Lions team. They can, they can balance their schedule a little bit. They can only basically get one win, and they're in the playoffs." You know, people were talking about it. But here's, and this is what we're going to wrap up the show with, because it, it's, it's a draft pick that last year, if you follow Mel Kiper, this guy was high on Mel Kiper's board. I mean, you look at Deshaun Watson; he was, he was a top five pick. At this time, last year, according to Mel Kuyper, this guy was the second quarterback on Mel Kuyper's board at number 13. The Lions got him in the later rounds of this year's draft. It's Brad Kaya. And as we talked about last week, his base, I mean, his mom's claim to fame is she's the by Felicia uh, in Friday. I don't know if anyone saw Friday after last week, but uh, I know I did, and I, st- I still laugh at that scene. I really do. But uh, the interesting thing, and this is why I bring it up. Last year, Mel Kuyper's top 25, and Mel Kuyper has been wrong a lot. And it's, this kind of proves that he's wrong a little bit because Kaya was 13, and granted, he was a, a, a mid to late round draft pick. Jalen Tabor, number eight, which, you know, if you want to look at that, if you want to say it was a waste of pick or not, he had first round value at the time. Uh, so taking him in the second round, not necessarily bad. Number 21 was Draw Davis, but we're focusing on Brad Kyle because it's interesting. You had a guy in Jake Rudock, and let's set the stage a little bit for the people, Marty. Jake Rudock, before he was a Lion, you had Dan Orlovsky, right? You had a guy. <laughs> I love the reaction. You, you have a guy who was, who was there quick, like just – as a Band-Aid. At first, he was a Band-Aid and a bridge to Jim Caldwell. He worked with Caldwell in Indianapolis. So you had the communication that he could help in the quarterback room with Stafford and Caldwell. That's why he was brought in. Plus, he was dirt cheap and the Lions were hurting uh, you know, with the salary cap. So you could actually have a, a competent backup quarterback instead of Kellen Moore, who still can't hit the broad side of a barn, even though when he was at Boise State, he could do that all day and then some. But Orlovsky served a purpose, and then, you know, the meritocracy era 
comes in with Bob Quinn. You look at his first draft. You look at this draft. He gets guys that are going to compete. And he, he could have been complacent and kept one of the right side of his offensive line. Instead, he upgraded it for less money, getting TJ Lang, who still has a questionable hip injury, but still is insanely smart and will help that uh, offensive lineman room. And then Ricky Wagner, who's much better than Riley Reef at right tackle. So the meritocracy era is now full, full in effect. And if you don't believe that, you can look at this, this draft with Brad Kyle. He's a guy who's going to be third on you know, the Lions depth chart. He doesn't know the system. Rudock does. So by default, Rudock is number two. But this guy has arguably more skills, more weapons in his arsenal than Jake Rudock. Rudock is a guy, if you want to use cl- cliches, He's a guy who brings his lunch pail and just does his job. He doesn't do anything crazy. He's a smart player. He's a safe player. And, he, and that's what makes him good. He, doesn't, he rarely turns over the football. He looks through his progressions, and he's fine. Doesn't have the biggest arm in the world, but he can make throws. Brad Kaya, same thing. Not the biggest arm in the world, but can make throws. He's more mobile than Jake Rudock. But when you look at that pick, you could, you could argue as a sheer value pick. You could argue that to the Cows come home because he should have been, with the run of quarterbacks, as a late second, third round pick. What were your thoughts, Marty, when you see Brad Kaya's name drafted by the Detroit Lions, where they got him, and where do you think his role is with this team? Because I think the role is to simply still create pressure within that quarterback room, making sure no one's getting complacent. And if you have him on the practice squad, if someone wants to sign him, fine. It's not the biggest thing in the world. But what are your thoughts on the whole Brad Kaya, former Hurricane, is now a Nor'easter because he's up here in Detroit and he's a Lion? I was confused as hell when they made this pick, Ben. I'm not going to lie. I'm you know. I, it's, I didn't dislike the pick. Like I said earlier, I didn't dislike it. I was confused because if Stafford goes down, we're relying on Jake Rudock, essentially a rookie, and Brad Kaya, a true rookie. What? Really? Like, like that's, that's, that's kind of I was like, wow, really? That, that's what we're going to do? I mean, I know I'm in the minority here. I wanted them to sign Jay Cutler to a, to a minor, a small deal whatever that would be, because he still wants to play. But, you know, he, he's obviously not now. He realizes that. I would have loved to say, hey, Jake, or Jay, here we're going to give you X amount of dollars. Come be our backup until Rudolph is ready. But they didn't do that, and that's fine. That's, that, that's fine. There was something there they didn't like, and it was probably just Jay Cutler that they didn't like. That's fine. I just It concerns me, because if Stafford goes down and he gets hurt for any amount of time, we're relying on rookies. Right, and that is almost never good. I mean, Dak Prescott does not happen every year. No, you know, so I mean, it, it scares me. But at the same time, I kind of look at Brad Kaya and I kind of go, "Okay, he is our Drew Stanton." And I say Drew Stanton because Drew Stanton has been Carson Palmer's understudy for the past what five years? Going four on, years? yeah, four. I think four. Going on five. <clears throat> so, and and when Stanton stands in for for Palmer, he's not terrible. He's serviceable until Palmer gets back on the field. And I think ultimately that's what Kaya's going to be. But I also, I I don't know, it it confused me. I like his story. I I like his work ethic. I watched him in a bowl game versus Louisville. uh, And I was impressed by his leadership, even though Louisville kind of put the shellacking on him quite Mm -hmm. a bit in that game. The hell, he always played well against Florida State in the rivalry games. He wasn't awful. Right. Like I said, I, I didn't dislike it. I was just kind of confused by it. I, I felt like that sixth round pick could have went somewhere else. Maybe you know, maybe a running back. Maybe they could have drafted that kid out of Cincinnati instead of signing him as a free agent. But ultimately, it's a sixth round pick, and who knows? The, the kid might not even make the roster. We don't know. But I, I tend to think his his intelligence and his 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 acumen and his his overall skills I think will help him make the roster. I was just kind of confused by it, but I and no 
in no shape do I dislike the pick. I was just kind of confused. Well, sure. And plus, here's the thing, though, too. And, and you, you kind of hinted at it. You scratched at the surface, and, and you didn't dig deep on it, but that's fine. That's why we're talking about it. In, what was it, week 12, week 11 against the Saints, Matt Stafford is playing with a bum finger. Yep. Matt Stafford can't miss time because there's no real depth behind him. So drafting Kaya allows for that depth. As you put it, though, Marty, you're right. Guys are inexperienced. Jake Rudock now is a little more experienced. So you can, you can maybe, in a playoff push, let Matthew Stafford sit and actually get healthy instead of being like, hey, hey, Matt, can you, uh, you know, go out there, do your thing with nine fingers instead of ten, especially on your throwing hand? Thanks, bud. Yeah, you know, it's not... You know, that's the thing, too, and that's that delicate balance because Stafford, if you have a competent backup, which the Lions, they didn't have under Orlovsky, and, and that's why when people bring up Orlovsky and I say he, was a, he served a purpose, it wasn't being on the field. His purpose was for the lack of money that he basically demanded and, you know, the familiarity he had with Jim Caldwell's system. Now. You know, you have this opportunity where who and Matthew Stafford, the guy's a road warrior who gets hit a lot. So mm-hmm. it, you know, and it's and it's something that he either plays hurt, which a lot of football players do. I'm not saying, you know, if if Matthew Stafford's a little dinged up, well, hey, Jake Rudock can, or Brad Kaya can come right on in. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying now you have flexibility there. So like, trust me, when the Lions drafted initially, my reaction was Oh, okay. Like that's interesting. Like I saw the value there because I know he was supposed to be a third round pick. Picked much later than that. He slid a lot. He slid further than Connor Cook did. And you can and granted, you can say Connor Cook's resume was a lot more impressive than Brad Kaya's, and you're a hundred percent correct. But you also, I mean, the Lions quarterback room is exactly like their running back room. Not a lot of veteran experience. I mean, granted, you're only veterans, Matt Stafford. Outside of that, you have nobody. You literally have nobody that can play the position. So, I mean, that's why, like, I look at the pick, and I and I see it because a lot of people, as, as you said, Marty, were kind of like, well, yeah, you could have taken a running back there, or you know, you could have maybe traded up to get Samaje P. Ryan in the fourth round, or you know, Kareem Hunt, or you know, you could have done something to move up, and you know. And then you could argue, well, Brad Kaya necessarily wouldn't have been there. So, it's, you know, it's just one of the things that I think overall, one, it's very low risk. You know, low risk, high reward. Best case scenario, he's on your practice squad, he learns, and, and you have depth. You know, you do. You have true, honest depth at the quarterback position. And you have guys that are going to push each other in camp. You know, you have guys that can, you know, maybe finally spell Matt Stafford because Arlovsky wasn't doing it. Kellen Moore wasn't doing it. You know, and maybe you do get better and, and maybe allow Matt Stafford to actually not play in every single game. Granted, a lot has to go into that. But it's just, it's just one of the things that, yeah, I just want to talk about just because it, it, it totally proves that also that this – front office is completely different than any front office at least that we've been used to in the last 20 years yep because the lions wouldn't have drafted a quarterback under martin mayhew like that because the lions fans were asking for someone to you know have matthew stafford compete against and they were like nope stafford's our guy we're good see ya you know they just let it they did they let it slide but this also shows that they still have faith in Rudock, but you can't have complete faith in Rudock because there's nothing there. There's absolutely no proof outside of people around here being like, well, look what he did at Michigan. Yeah, who cares? That's what that's called. It's a completely different, <laughs> well, right. completely different ball of wax. Well, right. I mean, that, that's, that's the thing. You, you can't be like, what? You know, like you, you can't bring that up. You're right. It's, it's totally apples and oranges. They're both round, so it makes sense. But beyond that, it, it's, that's all you got. So, I mean, it, and, and that's why like, I look at it, and it does. It truly signifies, possibly, 
that this organization is definitely on a different track. I mean, you not only, you know, in the in the draft prep, we're literally the Lions were seen at basically like every pro day, which veterans like Gil Brandt were like, this never happens, but the Lions are literally here like all the time. I have not seen a, a non Lions personnel person my entire time scouting. That's like that's a first that the Lions are doing. You know, you you have a pick like this where fans the fans have been clamoring for it. They got it last year with Rudock. They get it again with Brad Kaya. So do you see that that maybe could be a culture shift finally in Detroit where the Lions maybe actually have brains in the front office, like smart, intelligent football minds that aren't just playing off a Patriots playbook and seeing if it works. Maybe they can actually use that as a weapon in their utility belt, but actually maybe turn this franchise around into a a playoff contender? Yes, I do. And to draw a parallel, the Pittsburgh Steelers, who are one of the most respected organizations in football, even though I can't stand them, they did the same exact thing the Lions did. The first time in years the Steelers drafted a quarterback this year in the, in the mid-rounds, someone to groom behind Roethlisberger. Now, he's not supposed to take over the reins for Roethlisberger here in Pittsburgh. He's just here to learn and create competition. Because Landry Jones, which is the Pittsburgh version of freaking Dan Orlovsky, he wasn't getting it done. So the Steelers did the same thing. And, and it's funny because I saw this on Twitter too. All oh, the Steelers, Steelers drafted a quarterback. That's great. That's great. But, you know, that, that's the Steeler way. But then the Lions do, and they're like, oh, well, they must be shifting out Safford. Or, or you know, th- there's a lot of negativity. Not, maybe not even a lot. That might be overstating it. But there was negativity about the Kaya pick, which I don't understand. I, it, it, there's, there's nothing to lose with that pick. Like I said, it just kind of confused me. But, you know, if the Steelers can do it, why is it okay for the Steelers to draft a kid in the mid-rounds but, but not for the Lions. Well, yeah, so, I mean, it, I definitely think it's, 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 it's going to be a culture change for sure. Well, like, but this is like, you know, it, it's an interesting point too because, uh, God, who, who's their backup? Landry, was it? Right now, Landry Jones, yeah. Yeah, Landry Jones. That, yeah, that's his name. I was trying to think of his last name because I knew he was what? Out of, he's out of Oklahoma. Yeah, he, um, he, he took over for Bradford. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that Steelers, same situation. You have a, you have a clear franchise quarterback in Ben Roethlisberger. No one's going to say Roethlisberger's not, I mean, he took the Steelers on his back and promised Jerome Bennis, I'm getting you a ring before you retire and, and did it. Um, but yeah, you have Landry Jones behind him who you could argue is probably the same as Jake Rudock, you know, like he was a he was an okay to good uh NFL quarterback but you see him in preseason games especially last year where you know you in in the Hall of Fame game you're just like oh my god you're bad like yep. how are you this bad and then they do they take us they take what you can say is one of the biggest steals in the draft and take um what's his name Jalen Hurt I think um you know, out of Tennessee, and and you know he Dobbs. can. That's Kevin right. Dobbs. Hurd is the running back. Dobbs is the quarterback. Thank you. Um, but yeah, you you take you take Dobbs, who's a rocket scientist, literally, and you know basically as big as mobile like Roethlisberger, and you can work him in, get comfortable with the system. You still have Landry Jones working there as the backup, and then guess what? You can ship Jones. It's it's a very and, and that's why I like the parallel because it's a very similar parallel. To what the Lions have, so I, I like that comparison. I, I like it. That was a, that was that was good. I I appreciated that talk. Anything uh, before we wrap this sucker up? Any last parting uh, shots of wisdom, Marty, or anything like that? No, I just wanted to say uh, you know thanks for bearing with me recently, uh, giving me the uh, the time to kind of get with my family. I uh, really appreciate it. it. Was a scary scary time there. Um, like I said, you guys did great last week, and it was like you, you didn't miss a beat without me here, but. Uh, like that old Aerosmith song, I'm back in the saddle again. So we're gonna we're gonna have some fun, Ben. Oh no problem. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, we know life gets in the way of these things, and you know that's why we appreciate the listeners' flexibility. But yeah, I mean, we're not crazy. So you know, we we have a stable. We have we we have you know people that can fill in. But yeah, there's always gonna be obviously a seat for you here because you're Marty. Why why wouldn't there be a seat here? 
So yeah, I mean, I, I mean, outside of that, yeah, we're we're glad that everything worked out. You know, with uh, your father in law, glad that he's on the mend. And you're right that that is a scary situation. But what's not scary is the lineup we have at Sports Radio Detroit. We have the wrestling fans. We have out of bounds. We have Tigers SRD who had Dan Hasty who. Uh, he and I did work uh, a little bit briefly together at the ticket, and now he's the voice of the West Michigan Whitecaps out in Grand Rapids. He's doing great things. Uh, so you can listen to that episode. The SRD Roadshow every Saturday, Mitten Sports Talk every Sunday from 10 to 12. The Roadshow is on from 9 to 11 on Saturdays. If you want to catch it live, CRB Radio, uh, CRB Radio, uh, dot com And yeah, I mean, Pucking around is still doing shows because the you know the playoffs and going on and I I know Marty you're happy because the Capitals lost you've been pretty boisterous about that but you know Jason and uh, and the guys Steve. yeah Jason Steve they're they're all gonna they're gonna talk about it how can you not it's interesting Game Seven's all over the place you know McDavid and uh, and the Oilers coming up just a bit short. But we still have conference finals and Stanley Cup finals to go through on that. So they'll still do shows. We have ba- we've said it before. We'll say it again. If you can't find at least one show that you do not like here on Sports Radio Detroit, one, let us know because we can fix that because we always like to get better. Two, you're probably crazy. I mean, let's be honest. There's There's good content abound. Also, speaking of which, if you like the show, rate it on iTunes. It's very simple. You can, uh, you know, leave us a like, like, you know, if you're not liking the Facebook page like that, if you're not following us on Twitter, it's the easiest way to get the podcast. It's at sports radio D E T out of bounds has a great Facebook page. You can like their page as well. They're very active with it. They have funny stuff and they just, they talk about stuff that's off the wall and it's fun outside of that. That's all the time that we have for you. There's going to be more, obviously more lines SRD because like we said, starting this weekend, rookies they're in they're working there's going to be reports about it we'll dive into those reports give your opinions on that thank you so much for all your time hope you guys have a great weekend i'm ben salagi i'm marty stover we say good night <laughs>